tonight on CBC Vancouver News. There's a whole landscape of these different viruses and different variants. BC's hotspot for new variant cases, where almost all of the new infections are happening. Also, as an 18th Vancouver Canuck is added to the NHL's COVID protocol list, a restaurant operated by the team's owners is ordered closed by health officials. And... I mean, this is probably getting close to a million, maybe a million and a half eggs. The attempt to revive BC's struggling herring stocks. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. COVID-19 variants are proving to be relentless and a big concern for health officials. Yes, the variants now account for 20% of hospitalizations in our province. Tanya Fletcher is live with the latest on that. Tanya, hundreds, where in BC are we seeing the most recent spread? Yeah, it's pretty much all happening in one area. 207 variants of concern reported today and 206 of them alone were in Vancouver Coastal Health. The other one was in Fraser Health and overall that is still the region with the bulk of BC's variant cases. Now currently of the 328 British Columbians in the hospital, 63 are there because of variant cases. So let's break down those numbers further. One third of those are the P1 variant originating in Brazil and two thirds are the B117 first originating in the UK. Dr. Bonnie Henry says that one is clearly emerging as the dominant strain now accounting for one third of BC's overall cases. Usually one strain will outcompete the others at any one period of time. And for us right now, that is the UK strain. And it is now found, the B117 is being found all over BC in much smaller numbers outside of the lower mainland, but it certainly is being found everywhere. And as for the much talked about P1 variant originating in Brazil, that one has been more concentrated in Vancouver Coastal in particular, Whistler being a recent hotspot. She says there have been several different chains of transmission though, mainly through the end of February and it wasn't one singular super spreader event. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tanya, so what do we know about how powerful the vaccines are? against these variants. That's something public health is watching especially closely right now, whether those variants have a negative impact of the effectiveness of the vaccines. Dr. Henry says so far, we're not seeing evidence of that. And this is really important. We want to make sure that our vaccine programs are still going to be robust and strong. And one of the, the important things that we've done from the very beginning is ensure that we can link every single person who's had their vaccine and if they've tested positive for the virus. You know, the current supply of AstraZeneca, speaking of vaccines, uh, has changed tracks to instead immunize 55 to 65 year olds as part of the pharmacy rollout. But keep in mind, there are 700,000 British Columbians in that age group, so they'll need more than the current batch to cover them all. So there's hope the Johnson & Johnson vaccine may be available here by the end of this month, and the province is suggesting we'll use that to jumpstart our frontline worker vaccinations once again. Mike Anita. Tanya Fletcher live for us tonight. Thanks, Tanya. And there's more concerning health news for the Vancouver Canucks. Most of the team's active roster is now on the COVID-19 protocol list. Our Dan Bird is here live again tonight. Uh, so Dan, how many players is it now? 18 of 22 players. That doesn't mean they all have COVID-19, but they cannot play. Right winger Jake Vertanen is the latest to be put on that list. Concerning news for a group of very fit young people who are tested every day. The NHL postponed four Canucks games in late March, and the team's website now says six games are on hold. Again, a player on that COVID list has not necessarily tested positive. They could be self-isolating after traveling or have been a close contact of someone who has tested positive. A member of the coaching staff is also on the list. Now, when asked, Dr. Bonnie Henry says she's not aware of any of the Canucks cases being linked to the P1 variant. There are reports out there of that. She calls this a very cautionary tale. Spreads easily in young people, and young people can have very serious illness sometimes. And uh, I know um, that, that uh, even with the best of intentions, uh, once it gets in and it can spread without people recognizing it. Okay, Dan, so this is just one challenge for the Canucks and its owners. 
They're also dealing with COVID-19 outside the team. Tell us about that. Indeed, one of the restaurants the Aquilini family owns has been ordered closed because of COVID-19. Alisa Steakhouse in Yaletown is one of three Vancouver restaurants that Coastal Health ordered closed just a few days ago. A letter on the door says people who tested positive for COVID-19 were at the restaurant during their infectious period and may have infected other staff and customers. And based on the number of cases they're investigating, Coastal Health suspects transmission may be occurring at that steakhouse. CBC News has asked if there was any connection between the Canucks COVID situation and the Elisa closure. Coastal Health would not say. We have also asked the Canucks about any potential connection. No suggestion yet that there is. We've not yet heard back. Anita, Mike? All right, Dan Barrett reporting live tonight. Thanks. Now, as we've seen, some restaurants have completely defied health orders banning indoor dining. Others have made the decision to shut down patio dining when they thought it wasn't safe. Tonight, Zara Premji looks at the restaurant industry's approach to the new rules that came into effect last week. Uh, I just want to let you guys know we're not just going away. Rebecca Matthews is owner of the kids' restaurant Cordroy, and she wasn't holding back on Instagram. <laughs> When the orders to close inside dining came down last week, she defied them. Why we did this was no, not to make a couple extra bucks and or because we think we're better than anyone else. It's because things need to change. Over the weekend, Cordroy as well as Gusto and Olympic Village had their business licenses suspended, no longer able to operate legally. The owner of Gusto wouldn't go on camera again, but tells CBC News he too wasn't trying to prove he was better than anyone else. Rather, he made a decision to keep his staff and business afloat and safe, and says as a result of the closure, he's now lost thousands of dollars in inventory and doesn't know if his business will survive. Meanwhile, in tourist hotspot Nelson, B.C., Main Street Diner took a different and sudden approach during the height of service Saturday and made the tough call to stop serving customers on its patio over concerns for health and safety of staff and the small community. Just felt like there was a sudden influx of, of people that I didn't recognize. Uh, they, were, they were not wearing masks. They were pulling tables together. So he says while he was allowed to operate his patio, he felt it was unsafe to do so for the rest of Easter long weekend, sacrificing his business for the sake of safety. We flipped the close sign, uh, finished service with those that were dining with us and tried not to make a scene or, or have it be kind of dramatic. While Main Street Diner is back up and running, Gusto and Cordroy have been ordered by the City of Vancouver to remain completely shut until April 20th. And the city says failure to comply with the license suspension could result in violation tickets and ultimately even the refusal of a business license for the next five years. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. People aged 71 and older, as well as Indigenous people 18 and up, are now eligible to book their first COVID shot. It comes as the province launches a new online booking system. As Briar Stewart reports, more than 912,000 doses have already been administered. Gary Gates had his son Lucas by his side when he got his shot this afternoon at this casino-turned-vaccination clinic. I want to be protected from my kids because both have special needs, one with uh, Asperger's and one with Down syndrome. So now I feel safer being around other people and then coming home. You have to give credit to the, where credit is due. Everybody and Lucas yeah, logged on this morning and signed him and his mother up for shots once they're eligible. Well, I feel absolutely fantastic knowing the fact that the, the light at the end of the tunnel is closer. BC launched an online booking system today. Those over 71, along with Indigenous adults and those with certain chronic conditions, can book their shots now. Everyone else can register and will be notified when it's their turn. It was the simplest website I've ever been into. It just was four questions answered, entered, and that was it. The process much smoother than when the phone system launched last month and many reported spending hours trying to get through. We all become a little bit safer and we will get through this next few months until all of our communities are protected. But not everything is full steam ahead. Essential workers were getting the AstraZeneca vaccine, but that program is paused because of concerns it could be linked to rare blood clots. Instead, those doses are being given to people between the age of 55 and 65, where the risk is believed to be much lower. It's really critical that essential workers get vaccinated especially when we're looking at the numbers in BC, as I say, 
and the number of exposure notifications to schools over the long weekend was quite overwhelming. The province is hoping to start vaccinating more essential workers later this month once it receives a shipment of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. BC's goal remains to have everyone eligible receive their first shot by the end of June. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Almost all of Surrey's school teachers and staff have now been vaccinated. Almost 11,000 Surrey public as well as independent schools have received their first dose. That includes teachers on call and education assistants. Razor Health has ramped up the number of bookings per day from 400 to 1,500. Appointments are being made on a school by school basis. The man accused of setting fire to three Masonic halls in Metro Vancouver has been hit with more criminal charges. 42-year-old Benjamin Coleman made his first court appearance today. Coleman now faces a total of eight charges. This includes three counts each of arson and break and enter, plus one charge each of failure to stop for police and assault of an officer. Coleman was arrested last week after fires ripped through three Masonic lodges, two in North Shore, and one in Vancouver. Crews will begin spraying parks, medians, and other green spaces around Vancouver tomorrow. It's all to help eradicate an invasive pest, the Japanese beetle. Larvicide treatment will begin at George Wainborn Park tomorrow. It's gonna to continue for the next four weeks. The spray is not harmful to people, pets, or other animals. Residents are being asked to avoid green spaces on treatment days and those areas, Japanese beetles can significantly damage turf, gardens, and agricultural crops. Once again, another beautiful day out there. Mm -hmm. um, not a cloud in the sky. Tomorrow, completely different story. What's the bad news? <laughs> Yes, it's true. It's very much a rain again, on again forecast for the next few days. We started off with beautiful blue skies, Anita, you're right, but already those high cirrus starting to fill in in advance of the next weather maker. Our temperatures, though, are going to be a little warmer tonight because of those clouds. Let me uh, show you the current temperatures out there right now. Uh, the beautiful blue skies we've been seeing the past couple of mornings have meant some early morning frost with our temperatures getting close to the freezing mark. 12 right now at YVR. We're going to be cooler tomorrow afternoon, but we're going to keep those overnight lows up around five or six degrees so much milder start to your wednesday despite the rain that's the system that is sliding down the coast let me time out the rain start for you so taking you through the overnight i think we're dry until sort of just pre-dawn hours so 5 6 a.m that's when that front will slide down across metro vancouver notice the purples for the north shore snow levels coming down to sort of uh, 1400 1500 meters so we'll see some fresh snow for the local mountains uh, and on the island as well rain though through most of the day we've got on and off pulses of moisture right through to the afternoon when things will lighten up slightly but we really don't get that sun back until thursday and then we'll get it back in spades. I've got a, a very good looking Thursday forecast before the rain returns. I'll take you through the uh, fluctuating week ahead coming up. All right, look forward to that. Thanks, Joe. Well, the steady decline of fish in the Pacific Ocean is a huge concern. Recently, attention is focused on the plight of the Pacific herring. Once thought to be nearly inexhaustible, its decline is ringing alarm bells. Greg Rasmussen looks at a group fighting to bring back the fish, even in Vancouver's busiest waterways. It might not look like a promising sanctuary for wildlife. All right. But this biologist is determined to try. I mean, this is probably getting close to a million, maybe a million and a half eggs, if you actually went through and counted them all. Doug Swanston is part of a group working to create a home for herring, transplanting millions of eggs to a site where the fish once spawned. Historically, we had a spawn here in the 1800s. It was a source of food for First Nations communities. The fleets of the fishing companies compete for a share of the catch. Herring was once seen as a nearly limitless resource until overfishing crashed the stocks in the 1960s. Since then, stocks have varied, but were down 60% in a recent four-year period. But still, about 16,000 tons have been caught in this year's commercial fishery. 
DFO decided not to li listen to their own scientists. Or Indigenous communities and environmental groups have gone to court trying to halt the commercial catch. So, so this site in particular was a village site at one point? It was our summer village site, one of them. For thousands of years, the Tsleil-Waututh people have lived on these shores. Herring was a traditional food until they were largely fished out of existence. You only have to look up the west coast of British Columbia to see where herring still is and to see how Indigenous people harvest there. We did similar things and it was an important food source. The Tsleil-Waututh and other Indigenous groups are working to bring back herring to help the entire ecosystem. This is a more typical net. Vancouver's False Creek is the source of the eggs for the new transplant experiment. Years ago, artificial herring spawning habitat was created by a small group of volunteers hoping to help endangered salmon. The first thing a salmon looks for when it comes out of the river is food. And if you have a herring run right in that area, it's just perfect. You can bring the whole food chain back. If you start with the herring and work up, it can happen. Biologists say there are many reasons why fish stocks in Canada's Pacific Ocean are in serious trouble. You can see it's quite well covered with eggs. But rather than simply watch, some are trying to help. One tiny egg at a time. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Hmm. I mean, I know there's uh, obviously fish in our local waterways, but I had no idea that uh, herring were in the mix. No idea either, no. Yeah. Very cool piece. Very cool. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder, if you aren't already, you can also watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, provinces continue to point their fingers at the federal vaccine response as case numbers continue to grow. Why the Prime Minister is pointing the finger right back at them next. Once again, thank you for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. OK, pretty much all of us have had to learn how to be at home over the past year. It's been a challenge, but it inspired a piece by Canadian poet Tanya Davis. In turn, that work inspired a short animated film by Canadian Andrea Dorfman. And as Colleen Jones tells us, it's been included in one of the top animation festivals in the world. The reasonable feelings, discomfort, lack of focus. This is the latest animated film by Andrea Dorfman, How to Be at Home. You can message your family or your friends or your colleagues. You know. I was asked, uh, along with a, many other filmmakers, um, early in the COVID days, which seems now like an era, an eon ago, I was asked to make a film in isolation. I, of course, as an artist, was thinking about COVID a lot and how I could express it. Uh, but I immediately solicited the um, help of a collaborator who we've made many films together. Her name is Tanya Davis. If you are at first lonely, be patient. Back in 2010, they collaborated and made How to Be Alone, which became a viral video. It's fine to be alone once you're embracing it. This is the first book I used. From her small animation studio, she went to work last April and through the summer, drawing images inside of old books to be used for the animation. Because I really love this idea of books, and I love books, I decided I would animate in a book. And, uh, and I couldn't find animation paper anywhere because uh, art stores were closed. And I thought, well, I could use the books um, as the animation paper, old books. I was working on a, a 12 frame per second basis. So for every second of animation, uh, that you saw on the screen, I had 12 images. And sometimes that was just straight 12 different images. Is it harder to do film this way? I think it's actually perfect for COVID because it was at a time when nobody was seeing anybody. We were really home-based. The film has, uh, has gotten into the Annecy Film Festival, which is a, an incredible and prestigious festival for I mean, probably the foremost animation festival in the world. And it's in France, um, and it's in a pandemic, so I won't be going. Lean into loneliness and know you're not alone in it. Lean the film festival in France is another event she'll happily watch at home, virtually. Oh, we are connected. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. 
Yeah, definitely something all of us can relate to. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, just a uh, reminder, we'll be back uh, in a few moments. A lot of COVID-19 news from uh, across the country. Uh, until then, have a look at this live shot. The sun is still out, but not for long. Downtown Vancouver and the uh, North Shore Mountains in the background at uh, 619 Tuesday night. Many provinces are facing swells in COVID-19 case numbers and strains on hospitals and ICUs. As Hannah Thibodeau reports, this has led to some provinces taking shots at the federal government. But Justin Trudeau vows to continue his support. Even if the sun is shining and the weather is getting warmer, COVID-19 isn't done with us yet. The Prime Minister's message was bleak. Hospitalizations are surging. ICU beds are filling up, variants are spreading. In Ontario, where lockdown measures didn't seem to affect how busy some shopping malls were over the weekend, another day of more than 3,000 cases. And 510 people are in the ICU, the highest number since the pandemic began. The Ontario government will now start targeting vaccines at virus hotspot postal codes. When you have a, an inferno going on somewhere, you, you have to turn the hoses there. And the federal provincial sniping over vaccine supply continues. The health minister tweeting out how many have been delivered to each province and how many have actually been put into arms. I saw some tweet from the federal minister. Oh, we, we, we have a million and a uh, million three in the freezers. We just got those. We literally got them a few days ago. So before that, we're running out. Other provinces are also concerned about a consistent supply from the federal government. The vaccine we receive, um, we get it into arms uh, quite quickly, usually over that, uh, that week. Uh, and, and it's so uh, tight that if, if we don't receive the next shipment as expected, we run out of vaccines. The low level of COVID-19 in our province has allowed us to make choices to protect Nova Scotians and our vaccine program from the uncertainty of a still unstable vaccine supply. The federal opposition wants to examine the Trudeau government's response to the pandemic. The public inquiry would be a, a public demonstration that we were going to put the health and well-being in the response by the federal government in the time of crisis, put that at the forefront to show Canadians we've learned the lessons. The federal government wouldn't commit to a national public inquiry, but it didn't rule one out either. The Prime Minister did commit to speaking with the Premiers tomorrow to talk about how to get through this third wave. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. As we've heard in Ontario, the debate is not just about vaccines, but the urgent need to bring cases under control. As Mukta Gebrselesa reports, today that meant Toronto Public Health taking matters into its own hands with immediate impact on hundreds of thousands of students. Are you coming, Charlie? Parents are scrambling as schools in Toronto are forced to close with barely any notice. We don't have a plan, so we're going to have to figure something out. But the decision didn't come from the province. Toronto's medical officer of health made the call. COVID-19 cases are surging, driven by variants. More than 3,000 new cases reported today. And ICU admissions set another record with 510. I saw uh, a relatively healthy 30-year-old who was pregnant, who I almost had to put on life support. These are scary situations. And so, so dire that this doctor and more than 200 others signed this letter, pressing the province to impose more measures, including a stay-at-home order. So strict times require strict actions. That call didn't come today. The focus instead was on the next phase of the vaccine rollout. York, Peel and Toronto represent 60% of, of the, the COVID cases. So when you have a, an inferno going on somewhere, you, you have to turn the hoses there. Hot spots will now see people age 50 and up getting the shots, but younger essential workers will have to wait until mid-May. 
Not good enough, says this teacher. I think we need to start vaccinating education workers and essential workers now. What is the delay? This grocery store owner is wondering too. He and his staff come in contact with thousands of customers every week. Every night, he worries he will bring the virus home to his family. You don't want to uh, put anybody at risk. If it's a mother, father, grandfather, grandmother, and you're in a situation where you want to help as much as you can, and we're only human. If slowing the spread of the virus is the goal, then the province needs to change its strategy, says this doctor. The 20 year old who's an essential worker who gets COVID-19 in their workplace spreads it to their multi-generational family and to their kids that go into school. You know, that 20 year old is the better candidate to vaccinate right now. That is Mukta Gebrselasa tonight. In Quebec, the seven day average continues to push higher and Premier Francois Legault is warning April will be a bad month. As Allison Northcott reports, Quebec is moving on two fronts tightening restrictions and increasing vaccine eligibility. It was just open uh, not even two weeks ago. So. Gym owner Louise Argumetis is facing yet another shutdown as Quebec tightens restrictions it only recently lifted. It was uh, enjoying the comeback. Everybody was so excited. Everybody was in a good mood. And um, I feel like closing the gyms down will uh, make things difficult for them. Quebec's premier says while Montreal's cases are more stable than other parts of the province, he worries that could change soon. The month of April will be critical. So in Montreal and other red zones, gyms will close, places of worship will have a capacity of 25, and high school students will go back to alternating days in class and online. I ask for a last effort. The variant is very dangerous. Please be careful. Last week, Quebec imposed a 10-day shutdown in some regions outside Montreal. With variants in those areas fueling transmission, the province needs to lower the risk everywhere, says this infectious diseases specialist. We risk to have an exponential growth in the number of cases if we keep the measures as, as they were. The province is also adjusting its vaccine rollout after 5,000 vaccine appointments in Montreal went unbooked over the Easter weekend. Quebec's health minister Christian Dubé says it was hard to see that happen, but insists no doses were wasted and the province is now preparing to expand access. Starting Thursday, Quebecers 55 and up can get the AstraZeneca vaccine. And tomorrow, the health minister will lay out a plan to vaccinate essential workers and people with chronic illnesses. All those people living with that risk have been extremely stressed to get this. What is still stressful from the healthcare professional is that we still don't have a precise list of who, what are going to be those diseases. Teachers and other workers are also eager for details on when they will be offered the vaccine. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Nearly one-third of the people who get infected and fall ill with COVID-19 continue to live with lasting symptoms. At first, it wasn't clear what, if any, effect the vaccine would have on these so-called long haulers. But now, as the CBC's Vicodopia reports, some of them are getting their first shots, and the results are surprising. When Elaine McCartney got sick with COVID-19 last April, the pain, fatigue and mental fog wouldn't go away. I was going to the gym four times a week. I was running 5Ks twice a week. I could deadlift 100 pounds and now I have trouble lifting a coffee cup some days. Then last month she got the Pfizer shot. After a few days, her condition changed noticeably. I was able to go to the store on my own, which I haven't done for <laughs> eight months. Um, and my energy was up and my pain was less. I've had chronic, severe, debilitating pain in my shoulder and it was gone. Other patients are also seeing unexpected improvements. The first study out from the UK, still awaiting peer review, followed 44 hospitalized patients whose symptoms persisted. After their first shot, 27 of them had temporary side effects such as fever and headache. 10 saw some of their long COVID symptoms disappear and no one got worse from vaccines. There is a slight hint they might make things a bit better, although we're, we're a bit suspicious about that given the small numbers. 
There isn't yet a lot of published research into long COVID, especially in Canada. But in the U.S., which is farther ahead in vaccinating people with both shots, that hint of improvement is becoming significant. I have to say that's the first bit of uh, good news in really a long time. So um, very, very encouraging. But I think we're starting to pin down about a 40% um, of people are reporting either complete or significant improvement. This researcher is seeing that recovery in thousands of New York healthcare workers who had long COVID. But the science of why it's happening is still not understood. I think the most persuasive theory for me is that uh, the virus was never completely cleared or, or whatever remnants might still be there um, are now able to be cleared because the robust response that's triggered by the vaccines. Answers will come in time and will be welcomed by so many. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. It's battered South America and left Brazil's health system crippled. So what is the P1 variant and why is it so infectious? After the break, we speak with a disease expert. And finally, Canada Post issued a new stamp today in honor of a Canadian hero. Crowds gathered to mark the occasion in St. John's, where he began, in Thunder Bay, where he was forced to stop, and in Terry Fox's hometown of Port Coquitlam, B.C., where finally it all ended. Sue Stern was there. The Fox family and the people of Port Coquitlam were proud and delighted today when Terry's father, Roley, and Andre Ouellette, the minister responsible for Canada Post, unveiled the special stamp. To Terry Fox, the local boy who gave far more to his country than his country was able to give him. A stamp may seem like a small token to honor a young man who did so much. But this stamp will be available to all Canadians and seen around the world wherever Canadian mail is sent. Truly a fitting memorial. <laughs> They're lovely, aren't they? Here they are. 44 million 30 cent stamps have been issued, but the post office has no plans to donate any of the revenue to cancer research. There was a bit of a fuss last year when a group of people from Vancouver asked for a Terry Fox stamp. The rules stated quite clearly that that honor only goes to royalty or to people 10 years after their death. But the decision was finally made to break that tradition and Terry Fox's parents are pleased. Terry Fox started on his incredible challenge two years ago this week. Today, over $25 million has been raised for cancer research, and Canada still marvels at his remarkable effort, a dream that accomplished more than he ever imagined. Sue Stern, CBC News, Port Coquitlam, B.C. And that's The National for Tuesday, April 13th. For CBC News, I'm Knowlton Nash. Stay with us on many of these stations for more news later. But first, stand by for the journal.
Rising cases of COVID-19 variants swelling the numbers heading into hospitals. Bonnie Henry was quick to point fingers today. But as Justin McElroy explains tonight, the data behind who is getting sick simply isn't changing all that much. Another press conference by the B.C. government about the rising case levels of COVID-19 in B.C. And another explanation that sounded remarkably similar to last week, that it's young people, 20 to 39, that are causing the rising cases and having increased activity that is contributing to the surge. Chief Medical Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry telling reporters today that it was small group activities that were contributing to this rise. And it's particularly notable in our younger demographics now because many young people live, work and socialize in the same networks. For example, we know uh, a classic what we have seen many times is people may work at the ski hill but share a house or accommodation with six or seven other people. Some of them, them may work at a restaurant or at one of the bars or at one of the retail outlets and then one of them becomes positive, it spreads to others, and before we know it, it spread to a number of different workplaces as well. Now, it's a similar message to what we heard from the Premier last week when he told young people not to, quote, blow this for the rest of us. But there's still a big question over whether the data proves this out. Over the last six days in B.C., 44% of COVID-19 cases were in people 20 to 40. Now, that sounds high, but it's actually only up from 41% for the course of the entire pandemic. So far, it appearing the caseload is evenly distributed in the same way that it has for months and months now. Of course, with case counts rising for everyone, it means that there's plenty of worry about the transmission. Still waiting on the government to show exactly how that demographic is contributing more than it did before. Justin McElroy, CBC News. Vancouver. As we heard earlier, the province has confirmed another 207 cases of variants of concern, all but one of which are in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region. Joining us now is Horacio Bach, adjunct professor, Division of Infectious Diseases at the UBC Faculty of Medicine. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. I, I want to ask you, first of all, uh, what's the difference between the P1 variant that we've been hearing about and the the, the regular COVID-19 virus? So these variants basically are uh, related to a mutations that the virus are um, producing when they are multiplying in the host. So this specific variants basically has about 17 mutations in the genome, I mean, in the um, um, genetic information that they use in order to produce themselves inside a host. So um, this variant has a unique mutation that allow, allows him to go and um, multiply in a different way or that we still are, are investigating. It may be that it's related to the a fast production inside the cells. I have to remind the, the audience that these viruses, they need a host in order to multiply or replicate. Once they are inside the host, what they do, they hijack the machinery of the virus, mm. uh, the, sorry, the host, and they start to produce a new viruses. So it looks like this virus, uh, the number of um, final particles per cell is much, much higher compared to the original uh, strain that we call the Wuhan strain. Right. So is that why it's the, the P1 virus is, is more transmissible? Yeah, that is correct. We thought in the beginning that uh, that can be one of the hypotheses. The second hypothesis that can be also is that there are changes in the as a result of the mutation in the part of the protein that we call the spike protein that the virus is using to internalize the host. Um, maybe the little, little changes, so the affinity means the strength that is binding what we call the ACE2, that is a receptor that we talk a lot in the past, is much stronger and then more viruses can go inside the cells. So that is basically the two major hypotheses that can be related to that. And at this point, basically, you multiply more viruses in the cell, so every time someone is coughing or sneezing, you release much more viruses compared to the original strain. That is the transmissibility is much faster. All right. And, and, and why is a P1 seemingly more concerning for younger people? Do we know? 
We don't know yet. Uh, everything is under investigation, and all this investigation, they take a long time. There are a lot of paperwork to fill up and the research. Um, my feeling is that is the result of uh, gathering and the more social activity in that specific group compared to an older group that, you know, they will prefer maybe to stay home. And now we see that probably the spike uh, in the cases is coming up because all this, uh, we have the, the spring break finished and then we see the, the weather is very beautiful outside. So people are waiting, wet, uh, going out more and more often. And that is maybe the problem that you see more and more. All right, we're gonna have to leave it at that. We appreciate uh, your time this evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. All right, when a Port Coquitlam snack food company couldn't find any N95 masks for its employees, it decided to make its own. Now, you know, Foods is one of the first BC businesses given the green light to produce cup-shaped masks for the public. Here's a look at how they do it. pandemic hit, we ordered masks and we didn't get any. that um, the masks that, that we make are all, all medical grade. Even the general public, people in their offices, the schools, need protection. At-home learning led to a big problem. Kids who were meant to transition online simply disappeared. Why may they never return to the classroom? Cover coming up. At 641, there's a live look at Mount Baker just across the border in Washington State tonight. Another nice day on the south coast. Uh, hope you had a chance to enjoy it because the rain is returning. Johanna will time it all out for us next. This is Grace. She's a continental giant and Grace is nine months old. They just grow at such a fast pace from six weeks they're sort of this big, and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And they don't stop till they're 18 months old. Come on then, darling. Let's move you along. Come on. I think that they're very special. They're different. They're a lovely creature, very gentle. And these guys behave more like dogs than rabbits. Meet Darius, the longest rabbit in the world. These rabbits of unusual size can take some getting used to. When they arrived, my family looked at them and said, have you gone completely mad? And I said, no. I said, I just think they're amazing. They're so tremendous. Come on, you go over there. The continental giant is the biggest rabbit you can ever get. There are continental giants that aren't so big. It's just they seem to be enormous. And Annette's rabbits are world champions. They've held the Guinness World Record four times. And Darius is still the world's reigning giant. Darius is over four foot when you stretch him out. I don't know what it is, whether it's because they're brought up in a very laid back atmosphere. And I think that's why they just keep getting so big. No. Come on, boy. Stop that. Just stop it. You're too old. Darius, even though he's, a, he's an old man now and can be a bit grumpy, uh, he still likes his lady friends. <laughs> he hasn't lost his sparkle. <laughs> he likes his romance. <laughs> Leave her alone. You've been a naughty old man. Uh -huh. 
Well, new research suggests over the last year, tens of thousands of students have dropped off the school radar. They haven't made the move to online learning, in some cases because they haven't got access to it. And as Deanna Sumanak johnson reports, there are concerns those missing high school and elementary students may never return to their studies. When we talk about learning during the pandemic, Irvin student says there's one group of kids no one is considering. They're out of school with no prospect of return. Student and his think tank started an international commission to help locate and reintegrate the students who stopped attending school of any kind during the pandemic. When we closed the schools here, we presume that everyone elegantly went online. And we forgot that at least 6% of the population in Canada has no access to online. 6% of school kids in the provinces that had substantial school closures is 200,000 kids. On top of that, abusive homes, very pure, poor homes, children with uh, problems in English or parents with problems in English. 200,000 kids. That's Teacher and behavioral lot. expert Kirby and Mitchell says there's another type of student who has disappeared from the system. Students that I'm used to seeing uh, wandering the halls, they're no longer there. Students I'm used to seeing acting out in class, they're no longer there. And so those uh, numbers I see as students that don't fit the online space as well as the current uh, classroom where you have to follow certain restrictions. My biggest worry is that it's going to get so bad that we will never be able to get these kids back in. We'll never be able to reach them again. This problem is attracting global attention. The United Nations recently estimated 12 million kids globally have dropped out of school during the pandemic. This is a serious problem, and I do think that there, the UN Secretary General has a complete point about that it could be a generational catastrophe. Preventing that catastrophe starts with finding out exactly how many kids are missing, who they are, and where they've gone. There are efforts by individual teachers and schools to find the missing kids, but few school boards have a specific post-pandemic plan in place to track them down and get them back in the system. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Rescue crews are searching for survivors after a tropical cyclone ripped through some remote islands in southeast Indonesia. At least 160 people have been killed. Dozens are missing across several Indonesian islands and East Timor. Torrential rains triggered widespread flash flooding and landslides that have destroyed thousands of homes. The worst may not be over. The cyclone is expected to continue affecting the region for days as it moves towards Australia. All right, time now for our forecast. Uh, Joe, I just want to... Uh,
acknowledge that clearly my lobbying efforts have paid off to have the days of the week uh, change. We went all through that rain on Sundays and stuff. And, and you know, Monday was, Monday was, it was great yesterday. It was great, yeah, yes. Let this, be a, let this be inspiration for everyone. You can <laughs> be the change, yes. <laughs> we did indeed have a beautiful Monday out there. And, uh, yeah, we, we are going to uh, get once again see a nice... Uh, start to next week but i think we can start that nice trend by the time we get to the weekend as i mentioned earlier it's a bit of an off again on again forecast let me take you through the current temperatures because we're actually in a bit of a locked pattern across the country uh, a bit of an omega block so uh, hard to see in the current temperatures but you can see that bit of a warm-up down around minneapolis that's the high pressure that's not going anywhere. So we've got lows on either end. And in Atlantic Canada, we are going on day six of heavy rain uh, for places like Cape Breton, dealing with an ice storm uh, back end of the long weekend. And we are in a cooler pocket of air. That's why the mornings have been chilly. We've got the, the sunshine, but it has been a little on the cool side compared to our 30 year average. I want to take you through the rainfall for Wednesday. You can see up towards uh, Maple Ridge, the Tri Cities, getting uh, upwards of 40 millimeters through the day tomorrow. Uh, a good 10 to 20 millimeters in general for Metro Vancouver. So it's a pretty good rain day. I mean, we do need these, especially uh, in spring, and it is nice to uh, get them spaced out as we start looking ahead to spring runoff uh, with a cooler season right now or a cooler start to spring that sort of delayed our mountain runoff we'll be watching a warm-up next week closely to get those uh, exceptional mountain packs uh, mountain snow packs melting i'll be following that story closely taking you through wednesday with that rain and then into thursday look what builds back in high pressure we're back to the sun but look what's up in the uh, northern coastal sections that is our story for Friday, so continuing that one-on-one -on -one off before we get to the weekend. Kootenai is really the only uh, place across the province escaping that trough. We'll see increasing clouds, but it'll hop over the Rockies before getting down there. Everyone else looking to see dropping snow levels uh, and cooler temperatures, especially up towards the north. We'll be watching for those cooler temperatures to return by the end of the week. You can see that 9 and through Friday with that second low, but then... Here we go, Saturday, Sunday, and yes, Mike, Monday too, wow. our new favorite day. We are in for a treat next week if you're looking for some warm spring weather. He only lobbied for a good two years. <laughs> Finally happened. I mean, you have to put the work in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay, it was supposed to be a weather report from the spring-like streets of Moscow, but something about the brightly colored microphone cover was too tempting to resist for one furry passerby. 8 plus 9 градусов. Стоять! Иди сюда! Эй, стой! Soon enough, the weather report was back with a co-host who very obligingly posed for the camera and kept the reporter company. No word on who got the fuzzy microphone cover when the live appearance was over. The report, which happened a few days ago, has been a hit on YouTube. No surprises there, of course. <laughs> Well, he was the reason to get up in the morning. How one PTSD support dog changed the life of a veteran. The war in Afghanistan next. Three years on, this intersection remains a haunting reminder of how fast tragedy struck. It's where the Humboldt Broncos team bus hit a semi-truck that blew through a stop sign, killing 16 and injuring 13. The Broncos Tribute Committee announced plans for a permanent memorial, something player Logan Boulay's parents say is important for keeping the memories alive. This time goes along, uh, they'll know about the Humboldt crash, but they won't know so much about the the people or who they are. Evan Thomas's family will be at the site at 4.50, the approximate time of the crash. His dad not sure what kind of permanent memorial he'd like to see. What's there right now is so powerful. You know, everything that's there, people took time out of their lives to, to leave there. And every time we go there, the silence is, is so powerful. Also announced a $25 million tribute centre in Humboldt, including a gallery dedicated to telling the stories of lives lost and former coach Darcy Hogan's core covenant. Darcy got it. It's everything his core covenant, covenant stands for. That is what we need to embrace and grow. 
Attached to the existing arena, it will include another ice rink, a fitness facility, and physical therapy center. That's especially meaningful to Carol Bronze, whose daughter Dana was the team's athletic therapist. And there has to be something positive come out of this because if nothing comes out of it positive, then the, the tragedy is even that much bigger. Right? The fundraising campaign has some powerful support. On behalf of myself and my teammates, uh, just want to say congratulations on the new facility. You're an inspiration to all of us. All of this is still a few years into the future, but the families and the community hope this will keep them looking forward and not just back. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Gloria Makarenko at the 2021 Because Mothers Matter Awards on May 5th. Celebrate the resilience of mothers during the global pandemic at this year's awards. And the Doxa Documentary Film Festival is May 6th to 16th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, panel discussions and more, all from the comfort of your own home. Learn more at doxafestival.ca. Canadian war vet has said goodbye to his four-legged best friend. And for the past 11 years, his service dog has provided him with much more than just friendship. As Austin Grabish reports, Luna brought love and protection during times of depression and sadness. A kiss of love and an unbreakable bond. She doesn't leave the bed anymore? No, she hasn't been able to leave. Her... Her legs, she doesn't have the muscle energy. Luna is Jeff Logue's hero. The 11-year-old has provided him with endless love, companionship, and protection at his darkest times. Scarred after seeing the horrors of the Afghan war and sending friends home in coffins, Luna became his protector as he battled PTSD. I was a mess, and uh, I had uh, attempted suicide multiple times. She was one of the first service dogs to be certified for veterans in Canada and together with Logue inspired change in policy so service dogs could be on military bases. So she holds a legacy that uh, I don't think any other dogs will ever hold. Luna suffered from deteriorating health in recent years. Frail, in pain and a fraction of the size she once was, she officially retired two years ago. That meant Logue didn't go out much. He's still living with anxiety of crowds and fear of people. His bond with Luna ended Monday when Logue put her down. The story is just, it's, it's heartwarming. It's heartwarming and heartbreaking at the same time. Richard Armstrong and his wife Claudette donated Lucy to Jaff. The couple found the Belgian Malinois abandoned and tied to this fire hydrant in the frigid cold last year. A former police canine handler heard about Jeff's story and volunteered to train Lucy. She's now a certified service animal. She still has a lot of energy, hey? Oh yeah, yeah, she's, that's, that's her breed. She's, she's a working dog. Lucy has some big, sho big shoes to fill, uh, but she'll do a good job. In just a few days, the two have become inseparable, starting a new bond and friendship at a time that couldn't be more perfect. 
Austin Gravish, CBC News, Burden, Manitoba. Cute story for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're going to leave you tonight with these photos of baby owls in Tawasin. A viewer was out on Monday walking their dog in an off-leash park when they noticed something moving in a tree. Oh my goodness, it was a mother owl and her three owlets. Yeah, from 50 feet away, they were able to get these photos of the treetop nest. The tired looking mother <laughs> seemed to be having trouble getting her young ones to sleep. Something I think many new parents can relate to. Oh, they're so cute. You know, I'm always a sucker for owls, yes. birds. You and your birds and your birds. Very cute. Yes. All right, that is it for our program tonight. You can always watch it online, cbc.ca slash bc. Yeah, next uh, local news right here, 11 o'clock. Dan Burrett is in after the national. Thanks for watching. Have a great night. Good night.